Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being there. Thank you for having me here in Aurora. For me, uh, a little French and Swiss German, uh, it is quite a long way to come here. Uh, I'm really proud uh, to be able to present you what you have been building the last uh, years uh, at Tipeee. Um, we actually went on a crazy adventure, namely uh, building a new C++ package manager. And um, because if you want to reuse code, the best is to reinvent everything first. Uh, we started to uh, rethink the experience from the ground up, but also um, to look at what users were doing and understand what, what is the right thing to do. And I will tell you a bit about our adventures there and what we have brought so far. Um, I'm Damien, uh, and uh, so I work at TP. TP, uh, I said we are solving uh, three main problems of uh, C++ development. It's uh, mainly uh, developer onboarding, like having an environment set up in, in a minute to be able to build and uh, debug and edit code. At the same time, uh, being able to reuse any other people code independently of the build system or the package manager and uh, build faster to be able to iterate uh, very fast on your code bases to be able to um, uh, produce code that can be shipped to your customer uh, or to your users uh, in a simpler and a faster fashion. And uh, at TP, we do all what we do in C++, uh, unless we are obliged to integrate some tools. Uh, but if we can, we rewrite it in C++. At the moment, we are a small team, but we are going to grow. So if people are interested, we are hiring. Um, we have uh, mainly two co-founders that are techies and one developer. So there are a lot of, uh, of people coming uh, by the end of the year, like uh, we would hire seven people. And uh, we are all uh, with a background in uh, software development in C++. Uh, I worked the last 10 years in the IoT industry, embedded devices with Yocto, with uh, uh, microcontrollers as well, uh, embedded Linux and so on. And my co-founder was in the, Yannick was in the uh, automotive industry and uh, did strange compilers for Excel. Don't ask. <laughs> it's uh, about certified process and stuff. And uh, Luke is a junior developer that uh, we can give all the work to do and we can look at and uh, <laughs> then review. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is package managers. As you have seen, TP is not only a package manager. Um, but uh, it's a big part of the um, developer experience to be able to uh, reuse code or to ship code to others. And um, the reason why we need package managers um, is actually, in our opinion, uh, three main things. Code reuse and code distribution. And uh, simplifying updates, guaranteeing that you can leave at head or that you can get the latest uh, version of your, of your software or the code you depend on. And abstracting build complexity. Actually, package manager, they are also there because you want to abstract the time you've spent building some software. You want to reuse that and be able to um, use these binaries that you produced so that you don't spend the time again. But this is naturally some drawback. Um, this has, the, this has the, the consequence that you need to deal with uh, build system configuration as a package manager, while actually in package manager, it's just a box where you store binaries and uh, you just would like to end up copying and uh, downloading files. Uh, you need to um, handle the build system interoperability. If you look at existing package manager or a packaging system like Yocto, they have like integration for all possible build systems and trying to um, make them interoperate uh, on the level of a common sys root with uh, different tools like pkg config, fi um, cmake find package and stuff like this. And this is like a lot of manual work. It's a lot of uh, work that is, um, that, that is put to the, to the developers and to the package maintainers. And uh, we think that makes it very complex to get a good package manager. Um, the other issue is when you want to save build times, you also want to be able to use pre-compiled libraries and binaries. And if you want to do that, then you have to take care about ABI. But when you change a flag on your app, you would like to not spend the time waiting on the rebuild of your uh, package that you depend on. And most of the time, the package manager are difficulties to check that. And then you end up with ABI mismatches. And there can be funny ones like um, boost mutex add between C++03 and 11. If you had two libraries that will load on work on the same mutex, 
or two code, but they were compiled once with C++ 3 and the other one with C++ 11, you would have like interesting data races and deadlocks. And uh, dealing with that is a really complex topic. Uh, there are people that um, build systems like uh, Goma at Google that uh, have even the lib uh, C++ ABI inside the tool to detect, okay, if I do these flags, then it should have an impact on, on the ABI, so I have to uh, remove the cache and so on. At TP, we like to do the things uh, in a KISS principle, like uh, not because we are French and Swiss, but also uh, because we keep it simple, stupid, like the US uh, Navy knows how to do. And um, actually, we decided to consider any flags, any defined, any, anything that you give to the compiler or that impacts the build process somehow as an ABI uh, breaker. Um, but um, we don't waste that much of energy on a space because we have cool techniques behind. So we are super stupid, but uh, it, uh, it works pretty fast. Um, Build systems interoperability. This is the biggest issue, I think. Uh, if you look at uh, the different package manager, there are like tons of code just written to uh, adapt to an existing uh, install target or to an existing uh, build system. For example, this code is the best practice, typically, to uh, install um, a target from a library that you've built with CMake. So if you have a small CMake list file and you want but uh, this uh, library that you build gets installed somewhere in, a, in the system where you can either pack it or that you can even share with others, then you have to remember this stuff, do this boilerplate, and I can tell you, I think there is nobody that gets it right. And uh, when you get it right, then uh, the CMake fashion changes, and uh, if you've got it right in CMake and someone is using PKG config, then you have to do something else and to make a glue code in the middle. And uh, this is like a real L, but uh, life is like this. The C++ code system is fragmented. Um, the build systems are fragmented. Uh, I mean, there are so many ways to find a library. Um, when you see this code, and you think that on the other side, the user of the library, he only has a small find package, and he hopes to find the library. I think uh, we understand that it's not fair for users and consumers of software libraries, because you always end up spending two days uh, looking for the library you just downloaded. And um, I think this uh, fragmentation comes from the versatility of uh, C++. Uh, in 2012, when the first meeting C++ in Europe was started at, in Dusseldorf by Jens, there was an article about islands of C++, because there are people that are doing C++ in the data science. They are using C++ just to speed up R statistics package. There are others that are doing it for AI, so they are just converting Python code to something more efficient, for example. Uh, you have people who are doing it on the embedded, working with old compilers and stuff. And this is the, um, the impact that, uh, finally, uh, when you look at the nice map that uh, you can find at the CPCon, there is a big standard on very big islands, like there are the people that are doing um, uh, UIs on the right, there are some ships that are Qt, and there are uh, perhaps other people in the inheritance forest that are doing some mocks on virtual functions to uh, make their unit test. And all these code bases and all these styles makes it pretty hard to actually uh, have an ecosystem that um, works together. But it's not impossible, and I think uh, C++ is going there, and uh, I also think that um, it's uh, going to happen thanks to all what is, uh, what is changing there. I mean, there are many, many uh, package managers nowadays. Um, you can build your tool with Bazel, uh, because now Google say Bazel is the best thing, and uh, everybody should use it, and then uh, you can just rewrite the CMake you wrote before to, to Bazel, or you can stick to, to CMake and use something like VCPKG, Conan, Hunter. But uh, if you depend on a library that use either one of these and you use another one, then it will be fun. There are pretty cool stuff like Nix that uh, guarantees uh, invariant uh, build system path and reuses Docker layers and so on. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, but still, nothing works together at the end. And uh, to get it to work together, you have to add even more uh, work. And um, I think, and I, and I hope Yannick uh, at TP thinks the same, otherwise 
uh, <laughs> you should tell me. Um, build scripts and packaging scripts are actually something from the past. It's something that is just historically grown. We need them because the tooling is at a certain level of state. We have a compiler and you have, you need to download libraries, you need to uh, build them, you need to uh, write make files or to make them generated and you need to get that integrated together. But actually there is nothing that prevents this tool in getting better so that as a developer you don't need to do that. And this is what TP is all about. Um, it's about defragmenting the ecosystem by removing all the, or not by removing, but by hiding and by abstracting the complexity of build systems and of package managers so that you don't um, see them in your daily work. Like you don't usually, unless you are in a strong optimization or supporting new uh, platforms, um, you usually don't touch the assembler code. Everyone is uh, agreeing that the compiler is way better in generating assembler code than humans. There might be cases where it's not the case. So you might want to write assembler code, but it's the same for build system. Why will the human be better at writing a build system than a computer? After all, it's just machine-readable code uh, or machine-readable data that is being transformed in some other machine-readable uh, binaries. And uh, there is no reason why someone should actually uh, write that manually. The only reason is there is nobody what wrote the generator for them. And um, what you're trying to achieve with, um, with these systems that users use on script manually with imperative build scripting or by configuring uh, complex Visual Studio solutions in uh, 10, 10 fashions and uh, using tools to patch the XML automatically on each update and so. Uh, it's actually to ensure your software is compatible with uh, the one you, your libraries are compatible with the software you want to link to, is to reduce the build times. I think it's the, the key thing about uh, package management. It's just you don't want to rebuild what you already built. And uh, you want to have a reproducibility guaranteed that you can um, trust this dependency and that you can rely on it and that you can get it for the next platform that you need uh, whenever you want to integrate it. And we think we can defragment the uh, C++ ecosystem and uh, all this, uh, I would call, a mess of package managers and of uh, uh, man uh, build scripts and so on, in that that we hide them as in the, in the past Assembler got eaten by uh, the, the, the C front end and so on. Uh, simply by ref, ref, refing it all. The first thing is ABI compatibility. Many people are spending a lot of time getting there. There are people that get it right. But it's really hard to compute it automatically. Actually, I don't even think it's possible because how can you tell that this defines will have an impact on the ABI of uh, the use of a library that you don't have the source code for? So we consider that anything that is uh, impacting the build is uh, an ABI change. So we have an ABI hash that differs every time um, a tool is using a different um, set of flags or of defined that impacts the files that are included or the files that are linked to. The other thing we, um, we consider is that uh, actually today, package manager, they know too little about their content. It's also like, oh, call the build system. And uh, then tell me where the, the, the output that binaries are, and I will put that in a, in, a, in a zip, and I will transmit it to my user, which ends up uh, losing a lot of information about what is in this package. And uh, that is a big issue because if you want to depend on some symbols, who can, you who can tell you that this symbol is in this package? If I want to use the function um, element JSON parse, for example, and let's say it was added into a package. There is uh, nowadays no package manager that is telling you, oh yeah, this element JSON parse, it's in this package. Uh, you just know it because someone told you in a doc and uh, you uh, read a readme and you added it to, to, the, to, to your code base and then it just worked. But what you don't know is also what everything else that is coming with. You are not just depending on element JSON parse, but you are also depending on all the element JSON library. And perhaps you don't need it. And I mean, in C++, we like to pay only for what we use. And um, I think we don't like to tell TP is a package manager, but we uh, took this title because it's uh, the most obvious name for this uh, kind of systems. We like to think TP is a dependency manager in the sense that we can depend on finer granularity on things and that you don't get all what you will get uh, if you will take the 
package that a human had created. And uh, namely, I mean, in the past, packages were, in, were great because, for example, Perl Boost came as a big package of all libraries, 150 libraries. And uh, that was great because back then, internet was not uh, that broad. You get um, a USB stick with Boost on it and you could work on your, on your code and so on. But no, everyone is connected. Everyone can pull independent uh, libraries. And so there is no reason to like take 150 libraries to start building your app if you just need uh, Boost program options or Boost file system. By the way, it's in the standard, so. <laughs> uh, but I tend to prefer Boost file system, but yeah, that's another discussion. Um, and finally, the other thing is that you tend to repeat yourself by writing build script. When you write CMake list that tells, hey, I have a module that is named my library. It is in these files and I want to export it. Actually, you already told it in your software. You already made a namespace. You, in the future, you will make modules. You already wrote in the code all this information. You're just repeating them and doing mistakes by repeating them because uh, whenever you have two sources of truth, they tend to conflict. Uh, there are people that, are, that might be better than, uh, than, than, than me, and that I definitely think. Um, and they don't make these mistakes, but I think it's a lot of burden uh, to keep that in sync and to deal with refactorings and so. So why not just let the source code define the build? That's what we think is the solution. And finally, why would you need to specify um, on what you depend on? Why would you need to say, oh, I need the library uh, nlum and json from nlum and json if you already say, I use module nlum and json or I use uh, namespace nlum and json. And it happens that there are only so much libraries in the world that provides them. Perhaps you can say, I want a specific version, I want a specific source because I want a specific patch. But in the end, telling that you want nlum and json is something that is already written in your code. Even in a simpler fashion, if you include it, uh, that tells already a lot that you need this file. And uh, so at TP, we do parse the code to actually detect what you use as dependencies. But we let naturally developers uh, specify themselves if they want to override what was detected. And it's an early tool, so sometimes it doesn't detect it, so you still need to provide it. But that's why we need uh, more users so that we get more feedback and we can uh, improve and iterate on it. We have been working sleepless nights um, until today. Uh, because we are shipping now a big uh, update of TP. Uh, it was just released during the night. There is no bugs. It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> my two peers were, were on the other um, time zone, so it was really practical because we could work uh, without ending. I, I didn't sleep because we could talk then and uh, we could work a lot, but uh, that was really efficient, so perhaps uh, we should uh, split us on the two time zones and I should stay here. I, I like it, uh, I like the US. So uh, if you have the budget, I would definitely like to, to stay here and take a small office. And what we are <laughs> introducing now, uh, I use some drums because uh, in the town I come from is uh, when they do carnival, uh, they use a lot of drums like this. And it's named in Swiss German, it's named Trommeli. And uh, so what we introduce is fast builds from sources with the cloud and the global build cache. Basically, the, nobody in the package management world until today thought, okay, we could use the cloud actually. We could make it cloud first. We could actually forget about generating packages that uh, you need to upload and so on. We could generate them straight away on the cloud on build runners. And we actually could cache the output. So you don't need to actually um, download this, upload this. It's just in uh, available cache to anyone. And um, naturally there is a question of trust. That's why uh, at the moment, uh, we uh, only populate the global build cache from uh, our clouds. Um, but in the future, we might find the solutions to uh, um, generate trust about binaries and say, okay, if multiple people have the same output of a build, then we can put this output in the, in the cloud and uh, make it available to others. And uh, we also think that it's required when there is a cache miss, because there will be cache misses and there are always cache misses, it's required that this build very fast. And this is one thing at C++ where we are not so good. I used to do a lot of boost spirit and a lot of uh, grammar to parse uh, packets from the network or from serial ports and stuff like this. And my colleagues were always complaining that they couldn't build the library because they didn't have enough RAM or they didn't have uh, enough storage on their computer. So at TP, what you are now providing is uh, the possibility to build remotely. 
you can naturally do everything locally, but uh, whenever you build remotely, then it populates the cache and it can use the cache because it provides a guaranteed uh, invariant environment. And then you can uh, build way faster than you would do uh, if you would build everything from sources uh, directly. And it has the advantage that you don't have any ABI mismatches. And um, what we do to uh, build is uh, actually, and to actually register which things are in which files and which package provides which uh, um, uh, symbols, is that we uh, take an approach where we scan the code. We uh, look at the files that are in, uh, in your, in your, in your uh, workspace locally, and uh, we detect what is missing for dependencies. We detect the symbols. We detect that there is an application entry point. If there is an application entry point, uh, because on this platform, main is the defined application entry point, then we generate an executable and start a tree of dependencies from there. So you don't need to write CMake list or make files and so, but you can. You are not obliged to let it be generated, but it's a possibility. Um, and once we have gathered all this information, we generate uh, the information that can be helpful to split builds across many small files, uh, so that we have a higher cache miss in debug mode, a cache hit in debug mode, because if you change one function, and this special function uh, was split in a separate file, then if you change only this function, then we will only fetch this uh, or recompile this change. So this speed ups the build a lot. Uh, naturally, you might not want that for release builds. You might want uh, Unity builds and so, but that is for um, uh, like just using uh, and debugging and uh, iterating in your development process. And uh, finally, uh, these data are used to um, do the build, either with your build scripts or with the build script that TP generates. And this is uh, started on the remote uh, runners instances uh, that are started just for the user that, uh, that triggers the build. And this fills uh, data from the code scan on, from the, on the, the build cache. And so we have then a, a global collaborative build cache that everyone can use. Like today, nobody is afraid of cloning things from GitHub. We would like to have TP be like the GitHub for binaries. Um, whenever you need a binary, you need something, you can fetch it from the cloud and uh, you trust it because uh, we do a great work on the IOP. We can convince you of, of that. Um, that sounds easy, no? <laughs> no, it isn't, I see people saying that. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's not totally easy. Uh, before, when you want to do that and you are like a small little developer in uh, Europe and you say, yeah, I would like to, to start this project, you need to convince people to fund your ideas. And so you need to raise funds and need to find investors that understand what you say. And when you speak about C++ to someone who has worked in banks uh, all, you know, his whole life and barely knows what he's programming, it's pretty hard to get uh, funding, but we got there. And um, by the way, we are raising a new round, so if anyone is uh, interested, it's possible to join, no. Um, and um, what we did to make it happen is that we dog fooded everything that we did. Uh, it was terrible at the start because we made the build system completely from the ground up. We made the package completely from the ground up. So we blocked ourselves. Uh, at some point, it was not more possible to, to, to start a build. So we had to patch uh, the binary that we had uh, because all the binaries that you had had the problem um, so that it, it uh, doesn't have the bug. It was blocking on some network issue and uh, with redirection. And so we couldn't fetch anything anymore. Uh, but that we solve in the meantime, and uh, that makes the result of our work uh, pretty reliable because we use it, and we are not the only one. Uh, there are also uh, users using that uh, productively, um, using TP uh, either as a time saver for remote builds, like because you can have faster builds with uh, the cloud than you would have in your local infrastructure um, because of the different uh, optimization we do, and also because of the simultaneous generation. We have teams that uh, like replaced Vasimic list with the one that TP generates. Um, I, I will not advise that at the moment, but um, it works. So, <laughs> um, and uh, we um, we so have now, uh, as of today, released the global build cache, and uh, I will show you how it uh, works basically. Um, if I logging in into TP. Um, the first time, uh, whenever I log in, uh, I'm asked to, uh, I'm sent over an onboarding wizard. 
that uh, asks you to create a private secure vault that allows you to share source code with TP, or at least with the runners that will build the code on TP remote nodes. This vault can also be used for your local builds because it provides you with all the token that gives you access to the source code location and also to the uh, cache locations. And uh, whenever you created this vault, uh, this allows an end-to-end -end encryption between uh, your, your PC and uh, the remote build runners. But you can also build locally. It's not uh, like an obligation to, to build remotely. Um, it's just that uh, you have many more environments at your fingertips unless you have your own infrastructure somewhere. Um, we've wrote everything in C++, even this web page has some C++ on it. Uh, when you click and open your vault, uh, if there is no bug, naturally. Um, then uh, the um, encryption and decryption of the vault is made by a C++ WebAssembly um, module that you also use in the uh, local app. So in this case, I created a GitHub link as the TP asked me. Then it's possible to install TP either your IDE or uh, on your command line. And uh, finally, when you do a TP connect, you actually enable uh, for any builds that you do that are not for the platform that you have locally to be done in the cloud. So whenever you do TP build, it can either be local or if you say, I'm on a Mac and I would like a Windows build, I do TP build Windows, then it will start a Windows machine in the cloud, uh, automatically synchronizes the files that I have and uh, like extend my machine in the sense that suddenly I will get a many core machine with a lot of RAM uh, that I can use without uh, losing any comfort. So basically when I uh, do here a build on, with TP, I can uh, select either to do it locally or remotely. And if I say uh, for a remote build, let's say I would like to do a remote build on Linux, then I just say uh, Linux with 6617. Uh, yeah, I'm not so good in C20 yet, I'm working on that. I have taken, I've taken training this week, so I should be better. But uh, let, let's take it. And whenever I do that, actually, because I'm not on the Linux, uh, it will spawn up uh, a machine. And uh, I can also say I want a lot of uh, cores because uh, I think I need a lot of cores to build. And uh, what happens is that uh, TP detects the, de the changes that you have locally, spawns up a machine. And uh, when the machine is, uh, is ready, the files are synchronized there and uh, the build is performed on the Linux machine. And um, if there is cache hits to be done, then the cache are being taken. And uh, if cache needs to be updated, uh, it will also be automatically updated uh, based on what you changed. And um, that's uh, basically uh, what you can use TP4 to build remotely, but you can do the same uh, locally. You can just say uh, TP dot, and then uh, I'm on a Mac, so I ask for a macOS build. And then I simply have the same that happens. Everything on locally. There is no uh, internet co uh, connection required if uh, there is, uh, there is all, the f all the dependencies are there. And then I get the builds here, uh, either the Linux builds or uh, the macOS builds are stored in there uh, because they can be synchronized back uh, with the cache mechanism that we use on the packing mechanism. It's pretty efficient. And uh, you don't feel like you are leaving your local machine. You are not working in a browser. You can still work with the tools you have. Your source code sits right there. You can uh, look at the binaries because they come back. And uh, still, you don't need to have the full build system installed on your machine and so on, so you are faster to start something. If you want, you can. Uh, and the installation TP asks you if you want to build locally, then it's just like 13 gigabytes of downloads, and then uh, you have everything. Um, what we try to do with your global build cache is actually solving the package management topic. Actually, when you, are doing, when you are depending on package as a software developer, you are not interested in installing softwares on uh, a machine that someone will use. You are interested in installing libraries that you will use for the compilation process. So actually, what you're interested in is that your code compiles if you use these libraries. So you are, there is no reason why you would like to have exactly libboostfilesystem.so, for example. As long as you get the symbols linked in your app or in your library, uh, you should be happy. Um, naturally, you can ask for TP to do the right thing as it was in the, in, the, in the package in itself. But what we want to do is avoiding to store like full binaries, like full DLS or full uh, executables. We are actually storing all the parts that are needed for the build to, to, to happen and for the linkage process to happen. Um, and uh, if there is a miss in the, in, the, in the cache, then we will just rebuild that and add it to the cache. 
uh, based uh, on the cloud runners that are available. And uh, this has like many advantages in comparison to package manager is that we actually link your uh, software, your source code uh, on this uh, Git repository hosting with the build cache. So whenever you want to fork a project, like let's say you want to make a patch to LLVM, um, if I want to make a patch to LLVM before I had TP, I had to download LLVM, clone it. That's still needed because I need the code to work on. And then I need to build it locally. So I could just spun it and then go home. And uh, the day after, perhaps I had a successful build and I could do my patch. With the TP build cache, actually, because we uh, store the uh, cache based on some IDs that are linked to the Git repository, if you do a fork of a project and you start building in it, then it will find automatically the cache of the source of the project. And so you don't need to build anything, only the change that you do. So if someone already built this branch before, or a CI built this branch before, then you just get it as if you build it yourself and you just do an incremental build. And um, this works like this. Uh, you have the files in your workspace, typically C, C++ files. Perhaps some days we support other languages. At the moment, we are, we are better with C and C++. As I said, we are a bit religious on that, but uh, <laughs> we're working on, uh, on learning new things. Um, what we do is, independently of the code base, if it's already in a Git repository, or if it's not, if it's in another storage, we generate a Git repo that is a mirror of the existing work, workspace. If it's already a Git repo, we have a faster uh, process there. It's uh, more efficient and we can uh, select the, the root commit ID uh, based on, uh, on the existing repository. Otherwise, we generate one and we keep track of it. And so, based on that, the cache ID for this project will always be this red dot. That means every source code that um, is built on top of this project will always uh, relate to the same cache entry and you will be able to share changes between them. Um, then what we do, every time someone builds one of the commits, uh, we store the snapshots. And let's, if it's a LLVM build, that will make a snapshot of uh, almost 10 gigabytes uh, that we store. Uh, we naturally compress them. And that's where we uh, have a very cool uh, tool that helps us and that we uh, improved. Um, we actually use this snapshot whenever you change branches or if you do like a change back and forth, like you don't need to commit to have a snapshot for your local development. So let's say if I'm debugging something and uh, I do a changes in there that is like uh, putting the number two in JSON dump, then I, uh, I build that uh, on Linux, for example. Then actually, these changes that is uh, being replicated uh, on the cloud and being built there, if I already did exactly that change and if I already had uh, made this, uh, this code, it won't rebuild it, it will just take it uh, out of the cache because we base the changes that are not committed on the content hash. So here is, he had to build it and to update the, the global cache. But uh, when I will uh, put back the number four, then uh, I will get the, um, the, 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 change, the changes back and there will be no compilation that will happen, but I will still get the binaries that would have been generated if I would have compiled these changes. So that means I can, when I'm trying to debug something, either version A or B, I can always switch pretty fast between them because I always get uh, like the build immediately, like here, he saw that there was no change, he just extracted the build folder back to the JSON dump uh, 4, and so there was no build necessary. Uh, if it were missed or there would have been a problem, it would have thrown this information to, to you. And that is, makes it way faster to make patches, to change stuff, because whatever you already changed, you don't need to recompile it. Um, the advantage of, um, of that is that we take all the, all the snapshots that you have, or any snapshot that are from another user, because the other user doesn't have necessarily all the snapshots unpacked on his disk. Uh, we pack them at the end of each build, we generate a pack, and uh, the method that we use based on this ZStud is actually capable of uh, compressing 1,800 revisions of uh, Clang, LLVM, in 100 megabytes. So you have 100, 1,800 revisions that are like 10 gigabytes on your disk normally, with the compression algorithm and the way the file has allocated, you get back with 100 megabytes. So it's pretty fast to download, 
Freddy Bass to unpack and so on. And uh, that provides like a true uh, usable and efficient build cache. And uh, these comprehensive cache packs uh, contains all revisions. So whenever you download these 100 megabytes, you are able to unpack to many, many revisions from uh, your project. And uh, naturally, we won't keep like forever all the revisions in the cache. Uh, publicly, we will uh, keep like the head of the branches most of the time and just throw uh, things away whenever repacks happens. And uh, what is pretty cool about the solution is that we can guarantee uh, build isolation and reproducibility also on a local machine with the cache because we mirror your files in a central location. So all the paths are uh, fixed. They are based on the git commit ID and on the um, uh, repository name. Uh, origin repository name, and um, whenever someone else would like to build that, the same will happen. It will mirror the things in the local workspace, in local Git uh, folder that is fixed, and then we we'll try to build. And if you take one of the environments that TP provides, everyone can make his own environments in TP. It's uh, it's something that is uh, open and uh, it's based on toolchain files and on uh, Docker or uh, Visual Machine descriptions then uh, you can have the guarantee that the build is totally isolated and that you can depend on anything. There are cool stuff that we would like to do in the future, like uh, Yocto does that to allow caching builds, even if you are not in a container. For example, uh, they build a special standard library uh, that is named the libuni native. And this libuni native is just like the same Clib that you would have in, the, in, the, in your machine, but just with a given version. And it's doing the translation between the version on the host and the version locally. So the build that you do is actually totally isolated from the machine, uh, even though it's not running in a virtual machine on a container and so. And that's why uh, we uh, uh, use similar techniques and we'll use this technique as well to be able to provide the local cache without uh, any risk of mixing uh, systems on, uh, on a local machine so that you on whatever Mac OS, on whatever Linux, you can rely on the cache, actually. And um, that is uh, about uh, what we do at TP. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, we would like to get some, uh, some feedback on what we brought. Uh, we worked tip last night to, to bring, to bring the, this global build cache. We are super happy to uh, fix bugs if there are, but I think they aren't. Uh, we have a super good QA with three people. Now we, we uh, have people using it productively and they got it in preview before and so. So uh, if you like to build code faster and in a simpler way, let, just talk to us or uh, try it out. It's free to use, it's free to download. It's not totally open source yet, but it will at some point. It's just a matter of making the code organization and structure in a way that everyone can contribute uh, in a useful way. And uh, so we welcome you uh, in the TP community. Uh, and I'm uh, very glad you could hear me. And if we look at, um, for example, my private cache, for example, uh, and I look at the um, different uh, things there are, uh, we store the packet like this. Uh, there is always like a comprehensive pack for the build, one for the install sysroute, so that when you depend on the library, you don't need to um, uh, have the full pack of the build. You have only the pack of the installation uh, of the actual dependency that you need. And uh, we also have uh, platform libraries that were specific to this build that are also cached with. And uh, the builds are uploaded automatically to, uh, to GitHub. And uh, we have also a copy uh, on TP for the one we do on the cloud. And so we are pretty open and uh, easy to use. Just click on uh, sign up and uh, then TP connect. And normally after that, the wizard should help you get started with, uh, with a build system. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any question, by the way, or uh, any remarks? Yeah, so the question was, uh, how do we specify um, compiler flags or platform specific uh, settings? So basically we have, um, for this, I said we are not replacing existing tooling. We are just making it uh, abstracted away. So what we consider things that 
needs to be specified by a human. Like, let's say, for your understanding what macOS is, for example, macOS is this compiler on this, uh, this standard library, this C++ library version, and so on. This, we actually let the people encode with uh, toolchain files, like you know them from CMake, for example. So if we look at uh, linux.cmake, uh, uh, the environment in TP, uh, they are like just the toolchain file that you usually have with the flags. This is still a human needs to specify, but this is like the, the vendor of the target, or if you have a special target that you need to, to, think, to do something, you put the things in there. But then everything is considered to be Linux like this. And uh, we also have the uh, packer.js uh, sitting aside, that is the specification of how the virtual machine or the machine of this environment is. If there is none, then it's to be run on the, on the host. So in this case, it's just a Docker for Linux. But uh, basically, you put your flags in there. And if you look at Linux, uh, uh, it's linux.cmake. It's loading Linux 617, which uh, simply uh, add the flags that uh, we want to use 617. And here you could put the specific flags for the platform. But then, when it comes to the software, many build scripts they have uh, flags that are only required so that it builds. It's not something that the user actually needs to specify or wants to specify. This one we infer from the code scan. On the one we can't because it's a selection, like imagine you have a library that has two backends, like uh, uh, the Enloman JSON example we had before. If I have backend A uh, that is uh, made to, to, to parse uh, uh, object from the, from the network and the other is made to parse object from files, um, then, and you want to select the one you build in library, then sure, there we cannot uh, automatically detect that. And there you can just uh, put them in a declarative format. So not an imperative one like CMake and so, just putting the flags in uh, the project. You can just say, um, uh, you can add here a dot .opt file or add a specific option for your, op for your dependency. And this will imp impact the ABI hash in the sense that if the dependency is, is um, impacted by the change in any ways, then we'll consider it's an over ABI, even if perhaps it wouldn't be, but uh, it's the only way to be sure we are not breaking or mixing things, in our, in our opinion. But I, I, we might be wrong as well. We might, we might, uh, there might be a super advanced technique to detect that. But, but thank you very much. Does that reply to? Yeah, I have more thank you. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, what is the workflow if you have a library you're developing in parallel to an application? You, so you have a source dependency. Yeah. What is the workflow when you have a source dependency that you're changing? Um, you have no differences because um, I can show an example. Um, I will need to, to dig. Uh, but... Um, Basically, I think this one. Yes, um, this example is is like this. You, you would build because nobody builds the library for your platform because you just modified it at the moment. So nobody did the change. So whenever you touch the library, you need to provide the cache miss. You need to build the cache for this library. So it will take the code you have, uh, mirror it, build it, and then use it, actually. So it's populating the cache when you develop at the same time the library as when you uh, build um, uh, the, um, as, as if you are building your app, actually. And um, in this context, the libfoo here on app, app is dependent on the libfoo. Uh, it's just like uh, this reference, and uh, it will just uh, then automatically uh, build the libfoo uh, whenever you change something in the libfoo, and build the app whenever you change something in the libapp, and then it will make match the, cache, the caches. Because for each of the um, project, there is a different cache pack, and this different cache pack is uh, being then unpacked for them uh, independently. And actually, uh, you may, may not want to publish publicly the iteration that you do, uh, we um, provide also a mode uh, that I didn't show where you can type code and it builds automatically whenever you change something. And in this context, we don't update the cache publicly all the time. It's only if you do a proper build, let's say. And you could also say my CI is the only one that populates the public cache. But there is always 
two caches. There is the one, your private one, and there is the, the public one, because we cannot like publish everything if you have a private repository or something that is not marked as public on GitHub, for example, it's not a public commit, we don't want to push that publicly because that will be uh, <laughs> dangerous because we would infringe uh, confidentiality and so on. And uh, so in the context of building your own library, until the commit is published in the open, it will stay in your private cache that is also on, uh, stored in, uh, in the cloud, but privately to you, actually. I guess, and this works when they don't coexist in the same repo. Sorry? This, and this works when the library and the application doesn't coexist in the same repo. If you are not in the same repo? Yes. Um, then sh it works, but naturally you need to depend on the repository. So either you s say I depend uh, with the head revision, like always the latest, then whenever you push something in the library, it will always uh, fetch it and rebuild it. Uh, and then the cache will uh, register the information that it was this revision that was pulled at that time. And uh, whenever you redo the build, if you change the library, then you will see, oh, there is a cache miss, I need to rebuild. If you didn't, then it will take that. Yeah. But happy to, to, to get it uh, test driven. Uh, it's, this seems an interesting workflow in, 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 in any case. <laughs> so how do you, uh, when you cache the executable binaries, yeah. how do you account for somewhat hidden dependencies on the system that you'd have to scan? You'd have to, you'd have to open up and dig into to find that you had other things you need to have in the remote host. Do you understand what I mean? But in particular, I'm thinking of things like linker scripts that otherwise look like library files. You mean like, uh, if I understood that earlier, you're asking like... Uh, like, just a, like on Linux, it might look like a lib foo.so, but really it's a script that it pulls in lib bar.so or something like that. But it's not known at compile time at all because it's like a dynamic lib li library link. So we haven't released that yet. Well, but it's not it, just that it's dynamic. It could actually be static. It's just, you just, it rewrites your linker, the command entirely, like okay. based on the files on the system. So you can mirror the files like remotely, but then you would find that, oh, remotely, I didn't have the file that I need because I'd have to actually run the linker to find out what it needed. You understand what I'm saying? This might be just be an edge case you haven't accounted for, I don't know, but. Uh, I'm not sure we have a solution for that if the linker right. is hiding stuff from us, that, that might be. Uh, I'm asking, because we also have remote build caching execution system, so it'd be yeah. like nice to hear someone else. <laughs> like, <laughs> say, like, say what they came up with. But, what, what, yeah. what did you build, a, like homegrown one? or? It's uh, we're, using, we're using build grid, which is an open source technology kind of on the, on the build and caching side. Yeah. Okay, cool. But um, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, but but uh, yeah, for this specific case, I, I'm unsure we will um, handle it. What we have uh, that is uh, that we use internally, but we haven't released yet, is like a tool that scans the binaries for anything that uh, would be missing. Um, if uh, the linker would pull things on stuff that we couldn't detect before, and uh, in the future we'll also deliver a plugin API where you can have all the scan information that we scan, like you get the uh, abstract syntax tree with labels of um, what does this IST node need from the rest of the world? Like you get the full dependency chain and then you can add stuff in there and the, one of the plugins we have made for the example at the moment, but it's not released yet, it's uh, detecting DL open, DL sims calls. So we can also detect that so that uh, we pull these kind of uh, binaries that in principle are seen as unused uh, from, the, from the code scan because that is like string access to, to functions. Yeah, that brings up a Point out I, a point I, I didn't understand about that. So if you're doing this syntax scanning to construct a graph of a semantic graph of the, the, of the for the dependency resolution purposes, how do you actually do the parts without having the dependencies on disk? I find that like often your dependencies, the way you use them will actually change your your, your semantic graph of even your application. You mean like the graph of dependencies that are yet missing or not yet like downloaded? Just the fact of like including something. Well, there's a, like I can. There's so many things I can list that do that. But like like um, package config metadata, for example, the way you build against something it requires one pound define or another, and that changes the way that the graph looks. Or um, just non-determinism in a dependency you have, and like the graph looks different depending on what data week it is. Or like there's a lot of things like that. So I guess what I'm not clear on is how you can build a syntax graph without actually having the full build context already on disk. Um, we, in any case, the, 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 the graph is iteratively created. Okay. Um, sometimes we have the oh, case okay. like uh, we have the case like we want the symbol uh, function banana, but it's hidden behind the define, for example. Right, right. And uh, it, it takes us multiple paths to actually see. Uh, we need to bring this define to make it available, and then uh, to make it build actually. 
on the other stuff, naturally, at some point, we cannot, uh, uh, if it's really dirty, crazy code with right. a lot of macro metaprogramming, I would say, then perhaps you might miss things, definitely. Or if it's something that is only user selectable, then sure, we need to have this uh, option be provided by the user. But it, what we are trying to do is to, as user, to bring to the user the only ways to put declarative information sure. on no imperative information. Because I mean, in CMake, you will tell if Unix, then set this variable. Right, right. And in, in our world, that is a, a key that is named defines double point Unix, and then uh, comes this define that is uh, very specific to, to you or what is, uh, what, what is user selected, yeah. All right, thank you. But it's pretty interesting. Uh, we'll be happy to, to take it after, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. So I, I think the concept of scanning uh, the dependency is very interesting, but I, I struggle to understand from like, from my perspective, like from a developer perspective, how use it exactly? Like, how do I specify the repo I want to use, the version? Uh, like, I don't know if you know OpenCV, it's like massive uh, computer visual libraries, like lots of modules, uh, mm -hmm. like lots of parameters, like how do I check uh, how it's been configured? Uh, uh, how do I set options for that? Like, can you give more detail, like, on, yeah. from my pers like from a developer's yeah. perspective? Uh, so you're asking how you can select specific backends in OpenCV, for example, or how you can select which specific version and so? So the, 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 the dependency scan that we do is, uh, is, is naturally something that, we cannot know, oh, I want fork A from OpenCV because there is this patch in there. That is something we, we can't. But at least we provide you uh, with a base. Um, it's like, a, if you know NPM, there is package JSON lock, uh, where it specifies which version and so on is, is downloaded by the package manager. We provide you with a base file that you can modify uh, to actually what you need exactly. If you say, oh, yeah, I don't need OpenCV ma master, I need the special version. And then if uh, there are, um, uh, we are getting better in there. Like if we if we see that you use a function that is only enabled by a macro, then we will uh, at some point uh, detect it and uh, generate the, um, the the right define so that you can use this function. If it's too ambiguous, then we will ask uh, what what uh, what's happening and uh, if you want to set this define or if you could uh, provide details. Or in the worst case that we try to avoid, we fail <laughs> to build here. Yeah. But uh, are, are all like this information transparent for me? Like, can I actually see what you are actually doing under yeah. the hood? Uh, it's written in separate files. Like, it's not like uh, the tool keeps the things in his memory and so. So it's a file that you as a user you can modify. You could also write only this file and don't rely on the scan at all. You can also use TP as a build cache. You can use it as a build speed up, but you are not obliged to use the scan. You can uh, say, I want to use my build script and I want to uh, use these settings. And this is, um, if I show you an example um, from perhaps simply from the doc, uh, sorry, and documentation. Um, if you, it's possible, the, the, the tool will generate this file uh, based on the scan, but if you provide it, it will use what you provide. Um, and this, it's, uh, it's like, here I'm saying I'm, I'm relying on whatever boost is there. Uh, whatever boost, I want the latest boost. Uh, I want this well-known uh, boost actually. And um, TP won't, won't like uh, decide to take another boost fork or so than the official one if you don't specify. So it's, the, the tool will generate this file and then this file you can adapt it. And if you already wrote it or the tool was unable to write it, you can help the tool do that, and then uh, the tool will learn as well at some point. That is uh, on, so the, on, the, on the plan. To, to try, so this is free. Like if I want to run it uh, on my machine, have the cache locally, I can do it for free and it's like uh, open. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, to, you can go on the, you don't need to sign in, but I would like you to sign in so we can stay in touch and we can uh, learn from each other and so, but uh, you can actually uh, just go there, uh, run this install script and uh, this comes from GitHub, the releases, and uh, there is no like, uh, you are not obliged to be connected to the cloud, you can populate the cache locally, but you just need, for this you need to set force cache on, it's a environment variable, uh, because by default uh, we don't populate caches from local machines if the environment is not totally isolated. That's the only... And in theory, all the binaries will be open sourced. The, from TP? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just, for example, we have released a lot of stuff. No, because I mean, like, I cannot use, I cannot migrate my build system to something that if tomorrow, I mean, I hope not for you, but like if tomorrow you close... Uh, yeah, sure. 
Yeah. No, okay. No, no, it's uh, definitely, uh, on one end, we generate the build script in the tree. So you can also say, I can use the build script if uh, TP doesn't work anymore. That's, we generate like CMake list out of the scan, for example. If uh, the tool uh, uh, st would stop to be maintained by us or so, um, that definitely uh, shouldn't be a problem because we are planning to open source it. We are just lagging behind because we don't want to make an open source project that is not easy to, to contribute to, but just putting the code outside like this is, uh, wouldn't be great. So we are trying to clean up things and set the right maintainers and stuff. And that's the reason why we're hiring as well so that we can start to grow now that we have uh, the first users and so that are using it productively on the, um, we hope we can get new users and uh, we can uh, then, uh, uh, we are also happy for people that uh, register to share the code and so if uh, we see that we have a lot of discussion going on, uh, people that are interested in build systems and so we are looking for that uh, actually. Thanks. Does this, uh, does this whole thing work cleanly with Git submodules? Uh, you mean with Git submodules? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it works, but <laughs> no, uh, it works, uh, but not automatically. It's, um, there is, uh, you need to specify that this is a submodule in no format at the moment. It's a bit stupid, but uh, this will come, we actually we show that there is a submodule. We see that we don't have it and it will just be like a small piece of code and this should be in the next print, it should be done. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, don't hesitate to, to go online, register and try. Then I can show to my co-founder, yeah, I increased the KPIs. <laughs> no, just kidding. Awesome. So, session is over, I see on the paper. I thank you very much. I think there is a next speaker that perhaps wants to take the stage and prepare itself. Uh, happy to take questions uh, outside and also drink something with you. Uh, very cool, thanks.